This is Speaking of Shakespeare, conversations about things Shakespearean. I'm Thomas Dabbs, broadcasting from Aoyamagakuin University in Central Tokyo. If you are joining us on YouTube and wish to listen to this program as a podcast, you may click the link below to your favorite podcast platform. This talk is with Richard Stryer, Frank L. Sulzberger, Distinguished Service Professor Emeritus, Department of English, Language, and Literature, University of Chicago. We will begin by taking a close look at Richard's recent book entitled Shakespearean Issues, Agency, Skepticism, and Other Puzzles. This series is funded with support from the Aoyamagakuin University Institute of the Humanities, and also with a generous grant from the Japan Society for the Promotion of Science. Uh, Richard, thank you so much for joining our series and this program today, and welcome. Thank you. Uh, we are going to start off right off the bat with your new book, very new, out of the uh, University of Pennsylvania Press, that is Shakespearean Issues, Agency, Skepticism, and Other Puzzles. This is a series of readings and very close readings of Shakespearean text. Uh, there's a there's a kind of what I I don't know if this is the right word but interiority to your work you're inside these texts looking very very closely and it is an encounter of the interior of the reader encountering the text and also an interiority when you deal with the critics and the critical history of Shakespeare and you carefully go into detail sometimes pushing back. Uh, uh, some sometimes agreeing, but but you're it's inside, and uh, it's a a method that you have defined as promiscuous responsiveness. And if I may, I would like you to tell us something about the methodology you pre you present at the very beginning of the book, uh, before moving into uh, readings of various Shakespearean text. Great. Well, thank you, Thomas. I, I appreciate the uh, chance to talk about these things. Um, so the um, both parts of this odd phrase, uh, promiscuous responsiveness, uh, which sounds uh, sounds sexier than it is uh, uh, in practice, in, in relation to a book at least, um, both, both parts of this phrase are important to me. Uh, Promiscuous in the sense that it's very important to me, and this has been a kind of lifelong commitment uh, to the idea that we shouldn't be approaching literary text with various a priori in mind. And in a way, that was the sort of argument of my, uh, my second book, Resistant Structures, which is really sort of just focused on that that issue on, on trying to approach text without either methodological a priori, like the text has to deconstruct itself, or historical a priori, like, well, back in those days, nobody was a feminist. And um, uh, so, so the, the promiscuity comes from my feeling that uh, one use, one can use anything that comes to hand, that, that one, could, one can use deconstruction, one can use Freudianism, one can use traditional close reading, one can use historicism, one can use also, one can use symbolic reading, one can use literal reading, but so they're all, they're all available. Mm -hmm. so in that sense, that's the promiscuity, that, that everything is there as a possibility, mm -hmm. but, the second part is, in a way, the crucial one. The idea is that you choose the your approach in relation to what the text, in some sense, asks you to do. Now, obviously, this is a metaphor, a kind of theoretical construct. The text just sits there on the screen or on the page. It doesn't actually ask you to do anything. It doesn't even ask you to read it. It just sits there. But but once you are reading it, then um, my view is the text will, will instruct you as to how it wants to be read. So that um, 
for so that uh, here's a here's a an example um, that comes up uh, in the book. Um, so in the Tempest, which which is treated at length um, in the book, and three different aspects of it all related. Uh, there, there's the question of, well, what do we make of Prospero's magic? Mm -hmm. uh, he has these supposed magical powers. And there's been lots of scholarship about what a Magus does in the Renaissance, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's a real thing. It's something that, that various Neoplatonists thought that uh, could be done or one could become such a person, maybe, with enough uh, study, et cetera. Uh, and this person would have special powers over nature, et cetera. And that's all well and good. But then you realize that in reading the play, Prospero can't do anything to bring his enemies to his island. He can't actually leave his island. And if he has all these powers over nature, why does he just go back to, to Milan and take over? But in fact, we're told that it's an accident that his enemies, that the ship carrying all of his former enemies, uh, has come close to his island. And so, so one realizes that, okay, what's going on is that whatever powers Prospero has, he only has on his island. And then you think, well, what does that mean? He can't be a magus in the sense of someone who controls nature. So what's going on? And for me, this, this is the clue that we're supposed to read the magic symbolically. Not mm -hmm. literally. They were supposed to read it as a kind of power that one has outside of one's home base, mm -hmm. which points to the colonial reading of that of that text. So, so that's an example of what seems to me a a clue in a text of how we're supposed to read it. Yes, yeah, so the going well with the grain sometimes and against the grain sometimes, but I wanted to make sure that the our uh, students who watch this understand that uh, your methodology is tied to a now a very long history of close reading. And there are uh, debates within that, of course, there's the new critical school. Uh, you uh, very appropriately are, seem to be uh, in, in line with uh, the neo-Aristotelian, the Chicago School, uh, that has a long history at your institution, uh, at the University of Chicago. One thinks of William Empson when encountering your work and uh, that type of reading, and also other philosophers, J.L. Austin and Donald Davidson and uh, Aristotle, of course, and Nietzsche. Uh, come come in. So you weave the, these types of thinkers uh, into your reading of the Shakespearean text in in this book uh, throughout. Right, right. Um, the my sense is again that um, uh, I mean there there are various ways of bringing ideas, philosophy to to, to text, uh, and now uh, since I'm against a priori. I, I can't have a view of what is necessarily going to apply, mm -hmm. but I can have a view as to sort of how language works. And uh, the what I get from ordinary language philosophy and from Donald Davidson in, in particular is the idea that first of all, uh, communication is a remarkable thing and an enormous amount of the time it succeeds. Mm -hmm the miracle for analytic philosophers is a that we know anything at all about the world which we do which we can get right some of the time at least it's called science and also that in ordinary lives most of the time we actually understand each other so that when you say hello i say hello back and we understand we're beginning a, an interaction so uh what this means for me is that um Whenever possible, I'm going to take a text or a character literally. I'm going to take it that they mean what they say. Now, uh, that, of course, leads to all sorts of problems. What about people who are being disingenuous, who are trying to deceive you? What about cases where someone doesn't exactly know what they mean? And my view is that those are signals. 
that those are very much in the realm of responsiveness. That just as the text tells you, read X symbolically, read the magic in the tempest symbolically, read the potion in Midsummer Night's Dream symbolically, that a text will, will tell you that, for instance, Goneril's language in her very first speech to her father is so over the top and is written to be recognized as over the top that we are being told, don't take this seriously. Uh, and uh, other cases where someone says something very mysterious, where you think, well, why do they say that? That doesn't seem like something they could actually mean. So that when Iago in Othello says, I am not what I am, you pause and you think, no, wait a minute. What he means to say, what you expect him to say is, I am not what I seem. But instead he says, Shakespeare, what Shakespeare gives him, and there's not a textual problem here, uh, I am not what I am. So I take that as, as an invitation to recognize that something unusual mm -hmm. is going on. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, on the other hand, uh, I'm very much against moments where something that is meant to be taken literally is not taken literally. Mm -hmm. So that there's, um, uh, there's, as you say, there are a lot of a lot of critics mentioned in the book, and mostly they're they're used in a relatively straightforward way, either agreeing or disagreeing. But there's one chapter which is a major disagreement with two critics, uh, with Stanley Cavell and uh, Harry Berger Jr. on King Lear, and the reason um, that I uh, single these folks out, especially Cavell, who's a very important. Uh, voice in literary studies yes. as a philosopher coming to literary studies. Yes. So we have a kind of special authority. People go, oh, here's a professional philosopher writing literary criticism. Yes. Wow. Uh, he tends to take the blinding, he doesn't just tend to take, he takes the blinding in, sing, in King Lear as symbolic. So that he has all, practically half the cast, uh, blinding Gloucester, Lear blinds Gloucester, uh, Edgar Blinds, Gloucester, etc. And this seems to me utterly bizarre because one of the things that's important about this text is this horrible thing is not a metaphor. It actually happens literally, physically, and weirdly enough, on stage. It's been nothing like this ever yeah. in the whole history of theater until you get to the 20th century when anything goes uh, presented on stage. Yeah. This is what a messenger is for. A messenger comes in and says, oh, 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 Oedipus has poked out his eyes. You don't yeah. see it. Right. But Shakespeare stages it so that, so that uh, to, to make it symbolic in a situation where we get this horrible literalist is for me to sort of miss the force of, of what's going on. So, mm. so that's where, um, so again, I feel, but this is the same Again, this is within, as I say, ordinary language. So that I know when you're telling a joke, I know when you're um, uh, hesitating about saying something, uh, I know when you're reluctant to say something or when you say something odd. And I want to say, well, Thomas, why did you say that? Um, this is all within our ordinary interactions. And I want to sort of bring all that awareness to literary study, but do it in a sensible way so that we're not in a situation where everything has to be symbolic because it's in a literary work. That seems to me to be not a path that, that uh, it makes sense to, uh, to go down. So that, that's, that's really where um, Austin and Davidson uh, come in. That, that, I mean, Austin is, is the great philosopher of ordinary language. Um, he thinks that that um, within the way we ordinarily talk, yeah, the speech there, acts, uh, right, there are all sorts yeah. of all sorts of distinctions and important recognitions are already built in. We don't need a, a special vocabulary. Yeah. 
Also, uh, as an example of the a priori uh, that you're talking about, anyone, I think, now who had um, any kind of understanding of the uh, critical reception of Shakespeare, how Shakespeare has been presented, uh, Shakespeare's Hamlet in particular has been presented, the last thing they would expect is... Uh, a happy Hamlet, and you, one of your sections is happy Ham, and that caught my eye uh, because okay, wh how where are we going here? Yeah, well, you're not the only one. That's uh, when I've given uh, versions of that in places. Uh, it it does tend to raise eyebrows uh, from the people pay attention from the title on. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they think, well, oh, that that sounds weird. Well, I mean, I have to confess to having. Um, a certain uh, love of uh, upsetting the apple cart when it seems to me the apple cart is wrong. Now, when the apple cart is right, uh, if you want to say, you know, everyone recognizes this Goneril is a wicked character, I want to say, fine, yeah, we, I, I'm there. And I want to let's talk about the particular kind of wickedness she represents. After all, there are all sorts of different kinds of wickedness. She doesn't do them all. So, but on the other hand, uh, when um, uh, everyone says, well, Hamlet, he's a melancholy guy. He's the melancholy day. I want to say, well, wait a minute. Uh, one of the things that makes this play uh, have its particular tonality, uh, which I think is different from that of the other major tragedies of Shakespeare, is that you feel sad at the end. You don't feel blown away. At the end of King Lear, you want to go kill yourself. Uh, you just are, are so blown away. Yeah. Uh, and at the end of Othello, you're sort of angry. You say, how could he be so stupid? How could he have done this? Let this guy fool him. Uh, whereas at Hamlet, you feel sad. And um, one of the reasons you feel sad is that Hamlet dies. And he's the greatest talker in Shakespeare. It's the longest part in Shakespeare. And we're told at the end, the rest is silence. He's never going to talk anymore. Yeah. And you feel sad, but I want to say this sadness comes not just from him, but from the whole presentation of the kind of life he lived. So a melancholic dying is not especially sad. You think, well, this is kind of what they want, yeah. uh, not enjoying life. But it seems to me the, the play gives us a sense of Hamlet as part of the tragedy is that he was enjoying his life. He had a whole world. He had adoring parents, especially an adoring mother. We don't know much about his father's relationship to him, except that he idealized his father. So he must have had some sort of positive relation to him. He had his loving mother. He had friends of all sorts. He had a court jester that he enjoyed. And of course, he's he loves talking. He loves talking. He just loves hearing himself talk. He's very good at it. Yeah. And he loves to make to parody people. He loves jokes. He loves philosophical reflection. He loves all sorts of things. So, so the idea that that this guy is constitutionally melancholy seems to be actually not supported by the play. And it's very much, um, and here I'm kind of relying without saying it, on Freud's distinction between mourning and melancholia. Because okay. what I want to say is Hamlet's in mourning. Mm -hmm. that he that something terrible has happened his father has died unexpectedly and his mother has very shortly thereafter married this guy who first of all is hamlet's uncle and second is a guy hamlet never really liked very much to start with mm -hmm. so so he's got a reason to be unhappy yeah forgetting even whether whether finding out or not finding out that claudius has murdered his father, but just his father's sudden early death and his mother's remarriage, he has a reason to be in mourning. So, so that's different. Whereas, and you know, Freud would say that's the healthy response. Mourning is something you get over. Whereas melancholy, something has gone wrong. So, um, and then I want to say, well, not only um, is Hamlet somebody who basically had a happy life, which after all contributes to be a tragedy, as I was saying before seeing someone's life destroyed who had a life who had a rich life is much more powerful than somebody who had a miserable life mm -hmm. mm -hmm. so there's that and then um 
I um, it gets even a little more perverse because uh, what I realized, well, the opening scene, Hamlet is wearing black. And of course, everybody else is in party costumes because this mm -hmm. is a grand public event. You know, Claudius is kind of coming out as king, so to speak, in public uh, and taking taking the public uh, position. And so everyone else is wearing, and I would stage this, but everyone would be wearing bright colored costumes with the Elizabethans loved. And there's Hamlet, jet black. But uh, from reading uh, literature of courtiership and whatnot, I realized black then as now was the most fashionable color. Mm -hmm. The coolest dudes wore black. So the most famous book about courtiership in the Renaissance, uh, the book of the courtier by uh, Castiglione, uh, Castiglione, who's Italian, says, well, the Spanish are the best courtiers. And one reason you can see that is they wear black all the time. Mm. Mm. And so I went, wait a minute. So yes, Hamlet is wearing morning outfit, but this is the most fashionable garment there is. Mm. He's a cool dude. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, then I discovered uh, that um, all sorts of, of gestures which Hamlet makes fall into the uh, pattern of aristocratic display. So that when he, the, the Ophelia tells the story of him coming into her room with his shirt unbuttoned and uh, looking all distraught. Well, there's you, you again, you, you look in books about the melancholy lover and we're told this is how the melancholy lover looks. Mm -hmm. He's going exactly according to the script so that everyone would recognize, oh, okay, this is another way of being cool and aristocratic because this is how the melancholy lover is supposed to look. Mm -hmm. And of course, I discovered um, the wonderful uh, picture that's on the cover of the book. Yes. Uh, uh, this Franz Hals painting, which everyone thinks has something to do with Hamlet, but doesn't. Hals never heard of Shakespeare, uh, is of an incredibly beautiful aristocratic dude with a magnificent outfit uh -huh. holding a skull. So uh -huh. there's Hamlet at his most, most profound and introspective and we're holding Yorg's skull and saying, oh dear, oh dear, mortality. He is completely within this aristocratic code of, again, it's another way of, of being cool. Now, this is not a way of taking away from his sincerity, but just saying that, that uh, he's in a recognizable aristocratic world. Mm -hmm. He's staying with him. So, so that, that gives you the, the um, part of the happy Hamlet. The rest of it is um, his friendships. And um, uh, it's obvious that he has a wonderful friendship with his university buddy, uh, Horatio. Yeah. But one of the things that uh, even more than Happy Hamlet, what, what, what gets people out of their seats uh, when I've presented this material is uh, the defense of Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, uh -huh. who I think really do love Hamlet. Hamlet really did love and are trying to be good friends to him. And uh, as far as they know, I mean, they've been summoned by Hamlet's mother, his loving mother, to deal with Hamlet, who seems very upset. He obviously is upset. These are old friends that have been raised with him since childhood. These are, it, it turns out, these are very famous uh, Danish aristocratic names. So in a, in a coronation in the late 16th century, there were 24 Guildensterns and 23 Rosencrantzes. Ooh. So these are recognizable uh, aristocrats who would have been appropriate friends for the young prince, and um, so they've been so they they've been asked to sort of try to cheer up their friend, and then of course there's the question of well, but aren't they sent to England with the letter uh, that's supposed to lead to Hamlet's execution? Well, and of course Hamlet thinks they must know. But he's being a jerk there. He's an, and Horatio was a little shocked at his callousness yeah, towards them. Yeah. There's no way they could have known. So as far as they know, they're being asked to accompany a, a, a melancholy a, or an unhappy friend on a trip that's supposed to cheer him up. It's one of the things we do. We say, well, you're feeling you've just suffered a loss. Whatever's happened, somebody has died, very important to you. Take a vacation. Go on a trip. Yeah. yeah. 
that's what that's what Rosencrantz and Guildenstern think they're doing. So, so I want to say that they're that the loss of all these people, and I even want to say Laertes, who is often portrayed as a kind of thug, is not that way in the play. Is someone Hamlet has a lot of respect for, and has a lot of respect for Hamlet, and is another. I want to say these are all beautiful young aristocrats. Hamlet's the most beautiful of them all. So I think the Mel Gibson Hamlet has something to it. But I want to say this whole crowd, Ophelia, her brother, Laertes, Rosencrantz, these are all attractive young people. And by the end of the play, they're all dead, along yeah. with Hamlet. Yeah. So that's that's part of the the, the picture is is of a of a world that that was all set to be a happy world. Friends, yeah. girlfriend, loving parents, good education, enjoyment of his education, loving theater, and suddenly it all it all falls apart. Yeah. So, so that's so my my sense is that 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 uh, oddly seeing happy Hamlet makes you understand why the play is so sad. Yeah, that that's that's really something and. Uh, very enlightening. And this is one of uh, many, actually, times in your book that you do this sort of thing, that you push back against what we, uh, uh, I don't know if we've been taught to believe it in, in our reading, what, what we're bringing to the text, but yes, a priori, uh, assumptions, maybe traditional, maybe a resistance against tradition that in turn became kind of traditional in reading Shakespeare. But this is about reading, reading closely. Uh, and another example, and this was a little uh, difficult uh, to, for me to get through the ethics uh, in the mer your, your uh, readings of the Merchants of Venice are extremely in depth. And and in particular, the relationship between Antonio and Shylock, and that that really struck me. Also, I spent some time with that, the idea of the cross between being an enemy, being able to be a use uh, to, to uh, practice usury, and a friend or someone in not being able to, and that conversation uh, really struck me. Uh, the way you uh, examined that in terms of the, uh, I guess, Shylock's ethics and uh, also Antonio's. Yeah, one of the, again, I mean, for me, the great payoff of close reading, meaning slow and patient reading. And I have a uh, wonderful quote from Nietzsche about what's, how important it is to go slowly. And yeah. then all that matters in paying attention is be slow. Yeah. And, yeah. And for me, the advantage of slowness is you can be surprised, that you can puzzle over things. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I like, I'm interested in, you know, puzzles, in, in not in the sense of things that, that you sort of can figure out like a crossword puzzle, but things that, are, that, are, that raise genuine issues and th that you were surprised by. And as far as I'm concerned, if you're, if you're a reader who, as you read along, everything seems, oh yeah, that's fine. I understand it. Something's gone wrong. Mm -hmm. As far as I'm concerned, the more often you're puzzled, the better reader you are. Mm -hmm. Now it doesn't mean you just stay in a state of puzzlement, but it means you take that as an occasion to really think. Mm -hmm. So um, one of the things that, that, that struck me in going over the extraordinary uh, third scene of The Merchant of Venice, which is the scene where we meet uh, Shylock, uh, is that um, something happens to the legal situation in the middle of that scene, that mm -hmm. initially it's going to be a loan uh, to the uh, profligate aristocrat Bassanio, who's spent all of his fortune already and wants, wants yet more to go woo a rich lady, uh, who is gonna be uh, guaranteed and the, the contract is going to be guaranteed by his merchant friend, Antonio, who's the title character. Uh, everyone thinks the merchant of Venice is Shylock, but Shylock's not a merchant. Uh, right. yeah, Marlowe's Jew, Barabbas, and the Jew of Malta yeah. is a merchant. Yeah. But Shylock is a moneylender. He's not a merchant at all. Yeah. Completely different kind of thing, as he, as he emphasizes. He doesn't take risks. Merchants take risks. 
Yeah. Um, so, um, but he, so it's going to be this contract between Bassanio and um, Shylock with uh, Antonio as surety. And of course, all the Elizabethans knew standing surety was extremely dangerous. Uh -huh. All the advice books said, don't do it. Mm -hmm. But Antonio is prepared to do it because he, he loves his friend so much and pretends to be confident that he can't, that he's, that he's going to be able to uh, repay this loan easily. Uh, but uh, once Antonio appears on the scene and we hear about Shylock's relationship to him, and he explains why he despises Shylock so much, uh, and he wants to say, well, look, uh, we're not friends because friends don't lend money at interest. Mm -hmm. And this comes right out of Deuteronomy, where it's mm -hmm. clear that you don't that you you don't take interest within the tribe. Right. That you don't take interest from your brothers. Right. You take interest from aliens or enemies. Uh, and um, uh, so uh, Antonio Bill says, "Look, we're not friends. Uh, charge me interest because we're not friends." And uh, of course, that's what. Shylock should do. That's his profession. Mm -hmm. But instead, he decides to act completely unprofessionally. And he says, okay, wait, you say friends don't lend money to others, to their friends at interest. I'm not going to charge you interest. I'm going to be your friend in that sense. And so suddenly the, the legal situation changes from a contract uh, with a guarantor to with uh, a stated rate of interest, although we never hear what it was going to be, to a no interest contact with a contract with a penalty clause. Mm -hmm. It turns out in Elizabethan law, these were two completely different kinds of contract. Mm -hmm. You could either charge interest or have a penalty clause. You couldn't do both. Mm -hmm. Sherlock says, okay. I, I'm going to I'm going to be your friend because you've defined friendship as not charging interest on a loan, and we're going to add this penalty clause, which is the famous pound of flesh thing. Yeah, which yeah. Shylock presents as a kind of joke. Mm -hmm. Now, what's going on here? We don't know exactly, but what's interesting is it's Antonio's mention of definition of friendship as not lending at interest. Uh, and his mention of, well, okay, go ahead and take the penalty if I fail, that gives Shylock this idea. So there's some way in which Shylock is, seems to be trying to take Antonio at his word and uh, offering some kind of friendship or bond between them. So again, it's never explained why he comes up with this. I mean, this is in it's in the source story the pound of flesh thing is part of it's a famous story yeah. uh but why is he doing this does he expect does he actually expect to have the penalty and as he says whatever else is going on we're not in the realm of economics anymore because a he's not charging interest so he's not acting in his professional capacity and b as he says what good is a pound of human flesh? You mm -hmm. know, if it's mutton, you can eat it. If mm -hmm. it's beef, you can eat it. Mm -hmm. But human flesh, what do you do? It's not worth anything. Oh. So whatever is going on, is it is it some perverse form of an offer of love? Is it some version of hatred which transcends the economic? Whatever it is, it's something that transcends the economic, and that we that we're supposed to that we can watch happening even though it's very mysterious, we can watch this movement out of the economic mm -hmm. taking place in that scene, if we read it carefully enough. Yes. Well, I I wanted to uh, compliment you on, on the fact that in, in this type of consideration, when you take us through this, the, these... Uh, these considerations, as they do in their promiscuity, uh, encourage us to, to think... Uh, beyond it, it frees us a bit to think of more things uh, uh it gives birth to new ideas and uh, in in the case of the merchant i think that comes back to something we said earlier 
the the play sort of asks you to side with the what we used to call yuppie characters you know the the beaumont the beautiful people and these you know really kind of pretty people uh very uh, well presented and so forth and it encourages you on one level to side with them and to cheer them on as they show Shylock a thing or two in the end. Uh, when you look more closely at it, you go, no, there's some very, there's, there's darkness in these people. They're, they're, they're reckless. They don't seem to take responsibility sometimes for their actions. Basanio and, and uh, Antonio, uh, they feel privilege. And in the end, even with Shylock's ranting about this pound of flesh, uh, I think I, I saw a production uh, about ten years ago where they just played it straight. They didn't try to find. They didn't try to to make Shylock more sympathetic. They just played it as straight as I think you could, and it doesn't set well with you. He's uh, he's he's uh, he's overpunished throughout. And you can see it if, like like you do in the close reading where you go, here's this guy trying to negotiate this world and uh, whatever emotions that brings up in this man. At the end, I don't feel so much like applauding uh, these people for finally everybody getting what they want, which is what they expected to get all the way along. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. I mean, these are, these are reckless people, including it turns out Antonio, who uh, we find out doesn't actually have the resources that he pretends to have. And uh, his standing surety is just another, so we, for, for us, it means nothing. But for the Elizabethans, as I said, there were all these warnings, don't do it. You put yourself in danger. Uh, don't do it. So it's another reckless act. Um, so the, the Shakespeare, I think, meant us to be um, uncomfortable uh, yeah. in the trial scene. Uh, we can't not be. And, and there there are so many strange moments, uh, and one that 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 people don't think about enough is okay. Well, here's here's Portia, uh, disguised as the young lawyer. Now, uh, a friend of mine, a judge, said that's already a problem. She's <laughs> committing a fraud on the court. That's fraud, yeah, and that's that's a judge's perspective. She, but she is committing a fraud on the court. Yeah. But putting that putting that aside. What she, what she's of course most famous for, uh, inside and outside of the play, and you see actors doing the, the the speech uh, on television, is the quality of mercy speech. So she's our great spokesperson for the importance of mercy. Uh, now, while she gives this speech, half of which is about how mercy is appropriate to monarchs, why she gives this to Trilock, who is not in any way a monarch, uh, is completely unclear. But putting aside this sort of oddness of the of the uh, the speech as directed to Shylock, okay, she's the great supposed to be, if you take her out of word, the great spokesman for mercy. Well, what does she do? She beats Shylock by out-legalizing him, mm -hmm. by this absurd trick about the drop of blood, which makes no sense whatever, that if you're going to give him the pound of flesh, you got to give him the blood. That just goes along with it. And no one ever says, one of the strange things about the, the play is no one ever says this contract about the pound of flesh is invalid on the face of it. We would say that a judge now would say, of course, you can't have a contract to commit a crime. It's against <laughs> public policy. They would have said that in 16th century yeah. Venice. Shakespeare knew a fair amount about Venice. It's a place that the English were very interested in. That was anti-papal, et cetera. It was commercial. Yeah. So, but no one ever says that. The The premise is, this is a valid contract. And the question is how to get out of it. Well, one way out of it is if Shylock just takes his money and he's offered, he's offered, it's not clear, at least three times, maybe more than that, his initial loan amount. He doesn't want it. So again, Shylock's not, whatever he's doing, it's not in the economic realm. Uh, so he doesn't want money. Uh, he wants the contract fulfilled. And everyone agrees it's a valid contract. So the way Portia gets out of it is, okay, it's a valid contract, but you've forgotten this to specify flesh and blood. So you don't get, you don't get the point. 
So right. she, so it's a lease. So here's our spokesman for mercy, out legalizing the legal character. And what? And are we supposed to applaud? Of course. Oh, that's great—a trick. But the more you think about it, the more you think this is something very weird, because she's supposed to be forgiving Shylock, and instead, she's tricking him. And then, of course, the we we go on, and they take away most of his estate, and a further a further uh, dimension that's not in the original at all, because in the original, the 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 lawyer figure, uh, the Porsche figure, pulls the trick about no blood, uh, and uh, the 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 Jew who doesn't have a name uh, says, "Okay, well, am I going to get my principal back?" They say, "No, you're not going to get anything." So he just goes off in a huff, doesn't get anything. But Shylock is not allowed to go off in a huff, no, because not only does his does his estate get confiscated. For the most part, it's a little complicated what the arrangements are, but he has to convert to Christianity, which is something there's no hint of in the original. Shakespeare adds that as enforced conversion, which was already a very queasy idea all through the Middle Ages. There's a big debate about are forced conversions valid. So, so Shakespeare adds that just to make you even more uncomfortable. Yep. Uh, I, I, w- I wanted to segue to uh, what I thought was a brilliant uh, talk that you gave. This is available on YouTube uh, entitled uh, Shrews and Jews. And you you have this thesis embedded. I think you've added more into your book. So this is a while back. One thing great about what we do, Richard, is that we have a, a longer shelf life than uh, than some other uh, maybe people who are talking about current politics of the day and so forth. You know that that uh, the sort of like um, dairy products they uh, go sour very quickly. But uh, I liked watching the progress of, of, of this argument from that talk to your book. But also I like the contrasting of. To very, very, um, let's just say emotional to a lot of people. It is very, Shrew has become increasingly difficult to for directors and uh, people to play, people to accept as some kind of a Shakespearean statement, uh, as, as also, of course, the history of uh, Shylock and the Merchant of Venice. And in both cases, you you push back against what we uh, are our normal reception, maybe in many cases, discussed with uh, how those characters are presented and treated in those plays. Right. No, I mean, I, I don't want to say these are plays that are easy to uh, to accept, and I think there's something there's something meant to be a little disturbing. Uh, these are, after all, culturally uh, very uh, marked and difficult figures, the true uh, a, a woman who doesn't behave in proper womanly fashion according to uh, standards of decorum. And of course, the Jew is always outside the, the Christian community. Um, but I think one of the interesting things about Shakespeare's treatment of them is that things always get more complicated when Shakespeare takes it on. And um, and also, I mean, the more the more you know uh, about certain things, uh, the more it helps you. So, I mean, I uh, one of the part of promiscuous responsiveness uh, for me is finding out what you need to find out. So, so um, in the merchant, find out about penalty clauses and and usury and how these how these work in the Elizabethan world. Uh, and in the taming of the shrew, find out a little bit about the tradition of shrew taming. And um, once you do that, your your uh, your attitude starts changing a little bit, mm-hmm. uh, because the tradition of shrew taming uh, is a tradition of physical brutality. Yeah. And uh, there's a there's a long uh, ballad that Shakespeare probably knew uh, about. Uh, a guy who uh, tames his uh, shrewish wife, and this shrewish wife is is uh, you know sharp tongued and hits him and whatnot and whatnot. 
And um, he, quote, tames her by beating her bloody and then taking her bleeding body and putting it in the salted carcass of an old dead horse called Marl. And uh, so this is a shrew tamed by being put inside moral skin. So of course uh, she's confined and of course the salt goes into her wounds. And guess what? She's nice and quiet after that. That's your model of shrew taming. Well, okay. When you realize, okay, that's the model. Well, Petruchio never physically abuses Catherine. We don't get to call her Kate. I don't think we, we'd have that. Right, he can call her that. <laughs> we don't. She's Catherine to us. She's a, she's a grand lady. She's rich. She's educated. Uh, we're lucky we can even speak to her. Uh, and um, uh, we also get to watch um, people with enormous verbal ability playing with their verbal ability and enjoying it. Mm -hmm. So there are a number of, of sort of duets of wit in the play where she participates as well. Um, and then, I mean, there are other details in the play that, that people pay no attention to. Uh, their father, the girl's father, I mean, Catherine and her younger sister's father is extremely concerned with having them educate. And um, the education of upper-class women was, was something available in the Renaissance, but not necessary. And it was unusual. Not impossible, but unusual. Thomas More was unusual in educating his daughters. Uh, Galileo's daughters were educated. But um, this guy wants his daughters educated in Latin, and it turns out in Greek. And almost no one knew Greek in the period. Mm -hmm. But he wants his daughters to study Greek. So, so it's just giving us a sense of these are this is a humanist uh, household. And um, so so there, there, there's that. And so we, you learn a little bit about shrew tame and you realize uh, this is a play where there's no physical abuse. Mm -hmm. and, that, and then of course, but, but Petruchio has this speech about, his famous speech about taming is using a falcon metaphor that, he, that he's gonna tame his haggard, as he says. Okay, so let's learn a little bit about falconry. And it turns out falcons were extremely prized. And it was important that you treat them properly, that you love them. And the only good, there were two different kinds of falcons. Uh, one which was raised in captivity, which is called an ayas, and a haggard. Now a haggard is a, is a falcon who was brought in from out of the wild to captivity. And only that, the haggard, is good for hunting. If it doesn't have its wild streak, it's no good for hunting, which is what falcons were used for. So even in that speech, there, there's a complexity that, that, again, once you do a little thinking about it, uh, comes, to the, comes to the fore. Now, I don't mean to say that the, that the um, play can't be read as asserting hierarchy. Uh, I think it can be read that way. And of course, Catherine's big speech at the end is search hierarchy. But A, I think it's very careful in how it does it. Uh, and B, this whole thing might be to some extent tongue in cheek. She's playing, she's having fun. This is the longest and most eloquent speech in the play by far. Uh, and then um, one interesting thing here, uh, and again, th this helps with, with knowing a little something. There's another play in the period called The Taming of a Shrew by that famous author Anonymous. And in a Shrew, we get something like the big speech at the end. But the reason for female subservience is biblical, is that, that women were created after men and they caused the fall of man. Uh, Shakespeare certainly knew this other play and doesn't give us any of that. There's nothing metaphysical. There's a political analogy and there's a sense that women are not as physically strong as men. 
But of course, we live in the world of women's workout world. So we know that, that women, you know, being not as physically strong as men is something that could be changed. Whereas if it's metaphysical, if women cause sin and God made them that way, that can't be changed. So even something that looks kind of makes us queasy, you realize is something that Shakespeare is allowing a way out of, potentially, and mm -hmm. is not going the metaphysical route. So just as I think, yes, does the taming of the shrew, um, could it be seen as, as further in misogyny? Yes, it could be seen that way. Should it be seen that way? I'm not so sure. And the merchant is a little different because I don't think that it's in fact an anti-Semitic play, but not. it's afterlife is horrifying because after all, where do we get the expression Shylock for, for a money lender normally Jewish? Well, it's from that play. The word doesn't exist anyplace else. So it, it's, a, it's a play that's had a, a kind of um, destructive afterlife in a way that I don't think Shakespeare intended, but there it is. We can't we can't pretend it's not there. But uh, as we've already said in the play, whatever Shylock is doing, he's not doing as a moneylender. So it's weird that that's become the associated term. Yeah. Well, what I would want to encourage uh, anyone who uh, is hearing you right now, I, I would like to encourage them to to visit that talk on YouTube and, of course, uh, to uh, probe into your book and to the many other examples that uh, we, uh, well, that's the point here. We want to draw people to your readings. Do you have another YouTube lecture that I quite enjoyed entitled simply Why Shakespeare? And this is very close to my heart. And I've thought about it uh, all of my career, uh, how, you know, the, the, <laughs> maybe it's a little bit of a, a utopian prospect, but could we have an entire, just bring all these other great plays in and writers in and uh, integrate this period with Shakespeare, because it was such an enormous moment in uh, literary history and the history of theater. And it, instead, Shakespeare's been branded uh, just, you know, a quick story. I had a graduate class years ago, and I said, well, I'm going to put uh, Edward II. I'm, uh, I love that play. I want to teach it. And I'm putting that in. We're going to do Marlowe. And this play by Christopher Marlowe. Yeah, and I came into class and one student was in there and it, she was my student and she had to be there. Uh, and I said, well, where is everybody? You know, we usually have you know, a larger class. She goes, they want to they want to study Shakespeare. And I said, OK, run down to the student lounge and tell them I'm going to start with Othello. And so <laughs> I, I, worked, <laughs> I worked with I, I did Othello and then did um, Edward, stuck Edward in there. But they wanted, wow. you know, the real thing. And of course, I'm in Japan here. So this uh Shakespeare, the, the name Shakespeare, I wouldn't say it's iconic here, but it's very well known name. And that's what people come to, uh, in some cases, consume, learn. Yeah, I mean, one of the one of the things that might be worth saying is, so let's say Shakespeare never lived, perish the thought. Uh, the period in which he now didn't live uh, would still be the greatest period in English drama until the 20th century. Mm -hmm. Uh, that that we have all sorts of wonderful plays that are written by somebody other than Shakespeare. Uh, so the the way, and I have you know obviously nothing against Shakespeare. I think he's a an enormous genius, and I've spent my life you know studying uh, and trying to appreciate uh, the work. Uh, but um, what's what's unfortunate, as you say, is that there are so many other wonderful plays that are never performed, that people don't even know about. People never even heard of, you know, Thomas Middleton, unless you're an English professor or Thomas Massinger or, and even Marlowe, who maybe people have heard of, but how many people have seen a Marlowe play? Or even Ben Johnson, who, I mean, occasionally there's a performance of Volpone or The Alchemist or Bartleby Fair, but, how many people have seen those? So it's just um, uh, the there's. I have nothing against you know Shakespeare's uh, fame, but um, 
what about all the other guys? And it's it's um, it's a it's a some sort of story of um, uh, sort of cultural selectivity in a bad way. That it's as if, well, can't the culture? I mean, it, it seems as if we can in other situations, like where romant, take romantic poetry. Well, nobody thinks there was just Wordsworth. There's Wordsworth, and there's Coleridge, and there's Keats, and there's Byron, and there's Shelley. And we can accept that these are all great and interesting writers. Who's better? I don't know. Shelley or Keats? I know, you tell me. Who cares? Mm -hmm. But we have no trouble having a multitude of romantic poets. But somehow we don't seem to be able to have a multitude of Elizabethan dramatists. And I, I'm not sure why exactly. Um, yeah. Well, you you do speculate a bit. Uh, Johnson is very inside. He's uh, he's a city dramatist, and you have to uh, he, from classics to uh, quotidian life in London at that time in order to get some of those jokes. It's difficult, right. uh, and Shakespeare tends to universalize uh, a, a good bit more. Uh, Marlowe, I don't see, I don't see Marlowe as being inaccessible at, at all, uh, particularly Faustus and. Uh, Jew of Malta and Edward II. Uh, I find those to be straight on, you know. Uh, however, um, it, it just it seems, yeah, it, it might be difficult for Johnson. Um, another reason, too, that I, I, I'm uh, almost sure that you brought this up is the fact that uh, some of these writers were, well, the first folio. Johnson had a folio, and um, uh, is is Fletcher uh, the other? There were three big folio editions, but it, it helps to have a, a complete works come out of the period that you're after you're writing. No, oh, and the, it's interesting if you think of well, where would Shakespeare be if you didn't have the first folio? Yeah. And that's a very interesting, almost unanswerable question. But um, we wouldn't have half of the plays. Yeah. That's that's for sure, because only 18 of them came out in Cordo in a little paperback. So half of the of the corpus is known only from publication in the folio. So we wouldn't have Coriolanus, Annie and Cleopatra, The Tempest, all of the plays that are that are full comedy of errors that are folio only plays. So we already we already cut the corpus in half. And um well, would we, would we have gone and found Shakespeare's King Lear? Uh, I don't know. I mean, the version of King Lear that was on stage for 150 years from the end of the 17th century to the beginning of the 19th was a rewriting of the play by Nahum Tate, yeah. uh, which uh, a better people ending, liked, which people uh, liked better. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, or a ha happier ending, I should say, is an right. argument whether it's better. But. That's right. I'm definitely a happier ending. Um, but um, so even the plays that were famous in their time, like Hamlet, Richard the Third, Henry the Fourth, these were these were the ones, the real big hits in Shakespeare's lifetime. That there were multiple quartos. Um, maybe those would be revived, and and Shakespeare would be you know, would be a significant playwright if he if you had. If those are that's all you had, you had Richard the Third, Hamlet, and the two ver two parts of Henry the Fourth. Those are those are very good plays, but I'm not sure we'd have the uh, the giant. He'd have the giant statue that that he has, that he has now. Yeah. So yes, folio publication was an amazing thing, and what made his his fellow actors because it was put together by two actors in his company decide to do that. Is a real is is a real question. We don't know. It's a brilliant idea. Yeah. And maybe Ben Johnson, who was a friend and rival of Shakespeare, and said a lot of nasty things about Shakespeare when he was alive, uh, but obviously respected him a lot. Well, this is seven years. He's outlived his rival by seven years. Yeah. At that point, you can afford to be generous. Yes, that's right. <laughs> I think I think that that Johnson might well have gone to these guys with the idea of why don't you do a Shakespeare folio? Mm -hmm. I did one. Your guy, now that he's dead, I can say it, was just as good as me. Yeah. Uh, why don't we do a folio? Yeah. Because uh, the the there are very few, very little introductory material 
in the folio, which is unusual. I mean, it's a very expensive, grandly produced book. These often had lots of introductory material. The most major introductory piece uh, in the first folio is Johnson's poem about Shakespeare, yeah. uh, where he says Shakespeare was better than the ancients, yeah. which Johnson is almost inconceivable that he'd say that about anybody because yeah. he was such a worshiper of the classics. Yeah. Uh, so I think I can't prove this and I'm hoping somebody will find some evidence that Jim Shapiro or somebody will find in an archive some yeah. document that says, Ben Johnson went to these guys and said, hey, let's do a folio. Yeah, yeah, Until that would be nice. That, I, <laughs> I can't prove it, but that's my intuition. Yeah, well, I think they were still working uh, with the notion that these plays, just like when we were young, uh, I, I purchased albums, you know, vinyl albums, and they went there, of course, and they were, and I, you know, now look back and go, wow, I wish I had just purchased one and never unwrapped it, you know, how, how valuable that would be right now. But at the time we just thought these were, you know, for a garage band that uh, every, were very popular and uh, nobody put into the uh, area of um, what uh, immortal, <laughs> certainly not immortal poetry, but some of those songs have lasted. A lot of that music has stayed in there. So they've gained status in, in as, as a form of art. And I think plays were in that time in that same transitional period that people did not necessarily see play text uh, as uh, well, they didn't have there, there were not, not long lyric poems. I think you make the point that Shakespeare wanted to certainly wanted to be remembered as a lyric poet, and that had more status. I don't think the Bodleian purchased the first folio to their chagrin, even now. And uh, and Johnson may have seen that kind of market well. The more folios we have out here, the uh, you know, the uh, the, the both ships will rise with the tide, that kind of thing. No, oh, I think you're right. I think I mean there was um, different attitudes towards uh, towards uh, popular drama, and some people thought it was potentially serious poetry and serious art, and some didn't. Some just thought it was you know trashy Hollywood entertainment. And um, oh, I mean the the analogy that people make. I mean um, that Shakespeare is like a, a great Hollywood, like Alfred Hitchcock. So, uh, and it, it's, it's a great analogy because Hitchcock wanted to be popular. He wanted to make money. Shakespeare wanted to be popular and make money, which he did. Uh, but he also wanted to make works of art. And um, so it's a, uh, it's a good case uh, of someone that it shows you can do both. Mm -hmm. If you're extremely talented mm -hmm. and know what you're doing in both worlds, if you know, what a work of art is, and you also understand the popular market, like Hitchcock, or mm -hmm. in music, I would say, you know, Bob Dylan is is uh, is a case of of someone who who managed this, um, yeah. managed both to be enormously popular and to to write interesting uh, interesting works of art in his in his genre. Yeah, and to do that um, mysterious thing to gain. Uh, reception over generations you know it once you make it one generation then your prospects are much better you know you're in you're you're in somehow uh you get into school textbooks i'm sure uh, dylan is taught by uh, all over the place and uh you get um the next generation involved uh but some make it and some don't and i'm not sure it's always because the superior artist wins yeah, be nice. It's a nice thought to think that, but not necessarily true. Yeah. Uh, I mean, well, we've, we've been lucky in being able to resurrect uh, some great writers who were unknown. Yeah. During, like William Blake is one case, Emily yeah. Dickinson is another. And we, we're just lucky that yeah. Yeah. scholars have gone back and recovered them and made them made them part of the culture. Yeah. Uh, Fitzgerald, I think, uh, was seen as uh, popular. And I know, in fact, I know uh, or did know some of the people involved in bringing uh, Fitzgerald, uh, at least lifting, maintaining his status uh, in in school 
and uh, yeah, the, the great examples of Whitman and Dickinson, and of course with and with Blake now, Blake is it, it's going to have uh, it is having uh, his own his own renaissance because uh, with the digital t- technology, we can see Blake. You know, instead of just tiger, tiger burning bright is on the page. You, it's nice to have that extra art there too, as part of the as part of the close reading. You know, right. yeah. Uh, well, I wanted to do one more thing and then uh, allow you to go uh, have some supper. Uh, the uh, you allow yourself to do uh, authorial intention, and that's in our careers. That's a hot topic, you know, because there's a school of critics don't do that you can't do it how would you ever know and you uh, say no i i can speculate i can say i think shakespeare may have been trying to do this on, at, at, to go to, to as an artist and uh let's talk about that just a little bit it, the the uh the freedom perhaps to speculate on authorial intention right right well authorial intention can mean two different things, uh, at least. Uh, One of them is what the author says about his or her work, if if there's some some such thing recorded. And uh, one view of authorial intention would be, well, go see what Robert Frost said his poems were about, and that settles it. Another view of of authorial intention which is not necessarily in conflict with it, but could be, is that uh, works need to be understood in relation to someone making them. That that a work of art is not like a plant. It didn't just grow. Somebody made it. Someone sat down and put these words in this order together. Well, they intended the right to play. (laughs) There's intention there, right? We wanted to create a work of art of a certain kind. Yeah, which means they they were, and of course, in in a mimetic art like drama, you're sort of uh, you're basing what you're doing on some understanding of how ordinary human life works. So this is where um, this is where my hero William Empson comes in, and he could never understand. Why people, Why would you want to be an anti-intentionalist in literary criticism? Where what you want to do most of all is try to capture what was this, what is going on? What, what was the person trying to do in putting these words in these order? Now, now, this doesn't imply that an author necessarily knew. Sometimes and often people write better than they knew. So you can't, you can't necessarily rely on what they said about their work. They might actually do something more interesting than what they said. But again, part of, of the uh, my commitment to sort of ordinary language philosophy is this is how we understand each other is in terms of, well, you said this and you had some reason for saying it. And I want to know why. Why did Thomas want to tell this uh, story about Edward II? And I, you know, so and I have my little theory about it. And but this is just so normal to human life that that this is part of what I mean by sort of ordinary language criticism. That 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 of course verbal uh, activity has intentions behind it. I mean, one of the great one of the great insights of speech act theory is that the fact that something is true is not a reason to say it, because a million things are true. You have some books behind you in Japanese. You have a some piece of furniture over there to, well, so what? That if I say something, I have some reason to say it. And of course, a, a sympathetic listener will try to reconstruct, well, why did Stryer say this? And I think it's the same thing with, with literary works where we, we, have, we have words in a certain order that are supposed to make sense. And I think we're being asked to hypothesize why is it this way? Why does something, especially to come back to a different point we made earlier, why does something strange happen? Why does why does Shylock suddenly change the, the kind of bargain he's involved in? Why in the trial scene does he not list all of his grievances against Antonio? He says, I won't say. 
So, so you're being asked to recognize that something is odd here, and you have to ask. You're being you're being directed towards some issue with intention. So I don't actually think that it's. I mean, you can pretend to read uh, without uh, reconstructing intentions. I'm not sure you can actually do it. I'm not sure you can actually do it. Mm -hmm. And I think even deconstructive readers have to posit intention because they have to posit a general intention that's then undermined by an unconscious intention. Mm -hmm. But that's simply simply playing the game at two levels. It's not not playing the game. So I, I, I think that, that uh, what's important about sort of intentionalism from my point of view is it's not go ask the author. If that's as much to, although I actually think it's interesting if we're lucky enough to get an author talking about his or her work, my feeling is, well, that's interesting. Why not use that as data? But it doesn't necessarily solve the question. No. The question is going to be solved by, okay, what makes what makes sense? Give me a hypothesis that makes sense of these why these words are here in this order. And the better hypothesis is one that clarifies that actually say, oh, that makes sense. Might there be another hypothesis that would work also? Maybe. I'm not sure there's an infinite number of them, but uh, that's the goal as far as I'm concerned, to try to make sense of why these words appear in this order. And I don't think it's, and that you posit as whatever you want to call it, imminent intention, implicit intention, mm -hmm. the intention that's there in the words, apart from what an author might say about it. Mm -hmm. Although again, I don't want to poo-poo authorial remarks. I think they're actually quite interesting. and. We're lucky to have them. I'd love to have, you know, a little letter by Bill Shakespeare saying, well, here's what I thought I was doing. <laughs> yeah. And wow, wouldn't that, be, <laughs> oh, wouldn't that be great? Uh, have that. Well, Richard, I've kept you too long. Uh, and we surely appreciate you coming on here. It's a uh, late afternoon for you. Uh, and I, uh, However, I could talk uh, for, with you about these things and hear you, your your uh, ideas on this for just as long as you know possible. Uh, but uh, it's just fabulous to have you come on here. Of course, everything we've been talking about is available either as a lecture on YouTube and your books uh, and your prior books that uh, follow that are in the same type of genre of. Uh, of identifying problems, uh, a priori assumptions, and then moving against them. So, I, you know, there's so much available for people online. I'll just assume that anyone interested knows precisely where to go. And uh, and if I could, I'd like to ask you to uh, stay beyond the recording just for just a moment to debrief. But uh, I uh, I just wanted to thank you on behalf of the our uh, enthusiastic, not super huge, but you know, growing audience, and and myself uh, personally. Thank you so much for joining us here for this talk. I want, to thank, I want to thank you for for asking wonderful questions and giving me the opportunity to reach, I don't know, an audience I I might never have reached otherwise.